Hello Team FD and welcome back to Winners and Losers where we break down the latest and greatest World Cup action. And on today's episode, we've had to rip up our script because yep. just moments ago, Croatia knocked Brazil out of the World Cup just as it looked like Chich's men were going through with Neymar's 77th goal for his country, equaling Pele's record. But that feel-good narrative did not last for long, did it? As Croatia clawed themselves back into the game and won on penalties. Here to help decipher what the bloody hell has just happened, it's McCubs, it's Pat. Gentlemen, shall we start with our winners from this fixture, aka your standout players? And I assume there was a few because a hell of a team performance from mm. Croatia. Who wants to take Croatia? I'm going to come um, to Pat for the midfield. Oh, well, that's pretty much the easiest job in the world. I mean, really, it was the midfield, I thought, that kept them in this match. Admittedly, they gave up more chances to Brazil than they created themselves. But there were long stretches of the game where they essentially said to Brazil, come and try and press us. Mm. And when you've got a midfield of Brozovic, Kovacic and Modric, or Kovacic, as we found out he's called today, according to Jermaine Genus, then it's, it's extremely hard to get the ball off them. Everybody looks really technically adept in there, of course. But... It's also the fact that by keeping the ball, they stop Brazil gaining that momentum. And I think about the Switzerland game, where Switzerland defended really well against Brazil, but Brazil had so much of the ball that over time they just started to grind through the gears a little bit. Mm. In this match, Luka Modric, as well oh, as okay. completing, I think, 105 of 116 passes, um, and entering the final third 22 times, he also won five free kicks. That, to me, is really impressive stuff because it means that... In those moments, Brazil get a bit more frustrated. And as the game went on, you started to see that frustration come out on the pitch. You started to see it come out in Cheech as well, in the way that he completely changed up his wingers, changed up his entire front line, bar Neymar, in fact. So I think that their ability to frustrate Brazil in this match um, was almost as important as the way they tried to construct their own play. In fact, more so because they didn't really create anything in the match. They had five shots in the in the penalty area. One of those was blocked. One of those was a header. Their only shot on target was the goal. Um, so I don't know. I mean, to me, this was... I don't want to say it was negative football because they didn't just bunker, but this was a masterclass in saying to Brazil, we know what you want to do and we're not going to let you do it. Mm. I mean, you just spoke about Modric's uh, forward passes there. I think the way that he dropped in between the centre-backs to pick up the ball from them when Brazil did press high and find a way out nearly every single time was super impressive. What a brave performance. Just always wanted the ball. 37 years old, putting in that shift mm. for 120 minutes. Absolutely masterful. I think he finished with four tackles and interceptions. Uh, Kovacic and Brozovic as well, his midfield partners, McCubs, they certainly deserve uh, us to put some shine on yeah. them. Uh, and I know you want to talk about the fullbacks as well. Yeah, I mean, Kovacic, I think, yeah, very, very close to Modric in terms of the performance this game. OK, yeah, not, not as, you know, doesn't have the same, you know, star quality in terms of his pa passing in this match, but he was just everywhere. Seven tackles and interceptions. Um, and he was often, you know, as well as being, you know, that guy who was filling in for Sosa at left back at points. Um, he was also the guy who at points, you know, when Petkovic was trying to hold up the ball, you know, with no one any, anywhere near him, with, you know, six Brazil defenders coming back at him, it was Kovacic making, you know, finally making that late run into the box. Um, so in terms of the energy levels from him and Brozovic as well, like 12 recoveries in the game, like, yeah, I just think, yeah, the midfield in general, I think Croatia's midfield unit probably is the best at this tournament and they've proved that in every game. I don't think they get even get through the groups mm. without, you know, those three Particularly starting. balance wise, yeah. right? Like maybe not personnel well, wise, although pretty close personnel wise. Yeah, I, sensational. Well I, I just think like because that forward line is so limited and you know fair play to Petkovic getting that goal. He was effective when he came on, yeah, his physicality was. and his ability to hold up the ball, even though you know there were a few dodgy touches in there, um, you know, he does deserve a lot of credit. But Without that midfield, Croatia, you know, they don't, they almost offer nothing really. Mm. Um, and in this game, they were able to con actually control parts of it. They were only really, you know, there was a couple of moments, kind of start of the second half, wasn't it? When when Brazil, you know, when the, the back line looked a bit shaky, looked like they were cutting through a bit much. Richarlison was having loads of fun, you know, setting up Neymar for what should have really been a goal, quite wide angle. But... Well, having said that, we may as well get on to Livakovic because 
he was just superb all game. I know there were a number of chances, and credit to the Croatian defence, especially you know Vardiol and, and Lovren for for kind of closing down those central areas because Brazil were kind of forced into a fair amount of shots just straight at the keeper. But Neymar probably had the two best chances in the 90 minutes. You know he was on an angle, um, but Livakovic, you know his, his you know his ability to come out. And um, you know, close down the space was brilliant. Really, really brave, I think, from him. Mm. Um, and yeah, I mean, he he was the difference maker in the end. But um, Juranovic as well. I'm oh sure right, I know you're a big fan. My man from Hamill. Celtic, but um, just stuck five million pounds <laughs> on his asking price after that ninety minutes. At least, I actually think the least. best performance from a right back at this competition Oof. so far. I mean, t- I mean. It's hard to argue with from a defensive standpoint, at least, because he was up against Vinicius, who looked great in the first half. You know, he was then up against Rodrigo, who I think for the first 20 minutes, at least, after he came on, mm. looked really, really dangerous. And, of course, was having to deal with Neymar a little bit because he was being pushed out left um, by the likes of Modric and, and Brozovic as well. Um, and he didn't miss a tackle. He got 100% tackle success. Um, you know, was able to play out from the back quite well as well. Um, yeah, brilliant. And especially given that Sosa, you know, on the opposite flank was tarring towards the end in a big, big way. Um, they, they needed someone to be strong on the opposite flank. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I just think it's, it's just mad, isn't it? Croatia, I think only Germany since 1998 have reached more World Cup semi-finals than Croatia now, which is just... That's yeah. just outrageous. And a, a nation of four million people. Yeah, and they've also come from behind now in their last four knockout games in the World Cup. Just really impressive stuff. Never know when they're beaten. McCubb touched upon it just then. I did want to garner your thoughts on Cheech's substitutions because they did feel a little bit hit and miss, Patrick. Well, it felt like he was keeping his powder dry at first. I mean, there was a point... I think it was only really when we kind of got into extra time, it was halfway through extra time that he made two substitutions. Up until that point, he'd made three and he could have tried to really go for it, but it kind of felt like he hoped maybe he'd get to keep some of these guys fresh uh, going through for a match Mm. potentially against Argentina. Um, It felt like a strange decision to take off Richarlison, certainly. I think that that was a failure. Richarlison was the best creator on the pitch. Uh, created four chances, which was the most by any Brazilian player. And some of those slipped balls through when he came deep and one of the runners went in. Those did feel like the biggest chances. Well, they were the biggest chances Mm -hmm. of the game, uh, certainly on XG. I don't know. I think when he brought on Anthony for Rafinha, I think he was kind of having, he was dialed in to having to bring on Rodrigo for Vinicius. Because I think you need some sort of balance. And Rafinha often gets criticised, has been criticised a lot at this World Cup, because... I think people just don't understand the sort of winger that he is. He's a build-up winger. His job is to pass the ball forward, get it into the box. And the job of guys like Vinicius is to try and cut inside and score goals. Now, Vinicius can, of course, create a bit and Rafinha can, of course, score. But I think that Cheech's idea here with bringing on, um, taking off Rafinha and Vinicius and bringing on Anthony and Rodrigo was, I want to keep that balance. I want one guy who's more of a come deep and combined sort of player Mm. and one guy who's a running behind as it turned out, Anthony actually had some really good moments beating Sosa down down the left-hand side, at least at first, but he wasn't getting into positions in the box. There, there weren't opportunities for him to get into a scoring zone. And it kind of felt after a while like there wasn't really a plan to work it into the box, bar let's hope Neymar does something. And let's hope Neymar does something is a plan that's very similar to let's hope Messi does something, but Neymar... He's the closest thing we've seen to Messi, probably, but he isn't Messi. And so, I don't know, and I, I, I robbed of Richarlison to interchange with as well. I think that that made things worse, too. We were talking about this in the game, you know, the fullbacks. In this sort of match, when you're expected to dominate and you're not really getting any traction, after a while, you sort of expect the fullbacks to push forward and start to add to the attack. And in this match, you're playing Danilo and Ede Militao. They're playing as inverted fullbacks. Mm. And it means that they're stepping into midfield, but you don't really have anybody stepping into the wide zones to create so that your wingers get into the box more. So there was a certain point where it felt like Anthony and Paquetel were spamming crosses into the box, but for Rodrigo at the back stick? Um, I don't know, it just feels like there wasn't a particularly coherent plan at that point. I would have liked to see Paquetel push into that left half space and maybe play some crosses, or to have seen maybe Danny Alves come on and let's try and get him opportunities to cross. It it just seemed like, I don't know, Neymar will do something. And eventually he did, but I don't know. I, I, I felt like it was a very... 
Chicha has played this five and five this whole tournament. Five defenders, five attackers. It's kind of been like, these are the guys who defend, mm. these are the guys who attack. And that's fine. You can have a broken system that works really well. But when things don't work, you would like to see him change it up. And in a way that I've seen, say, Scaloni do this tournament, I've seen even Southgate do this tournament, I would have liked to have seen a little bit of that from Cheech. Mm. I think it was not particularly good management. I thought early in this competition that it might be their fullbacks might cost them from a defensive standpoint deep in the tournament. We saw it yeah, at, at sure. times with Militao maybe being a little bit narrow uh, in the build-up to the goal that was uh, down that right-hand side. Yeah. He, he kind of came inside a little bit because, you know, that's his natural instincts as a centre-half. Uh, that Danilo uh, wasn't necessarily... Well, he, he's always been sound defensively, but um, not not a great two-way fullback, let's say, although his, his form has been fine for, for Juventus. But it was... The, their lack of impetus going forward, wasn't it? That sort of stunted Brazil's attack. Everything became very narrow. And I thought Croatia were great at funneling them into the middle of the pitch, yeah. trying to make them operate in those half spaces, like Pat said, and ultimately just forcing them wide of goal. I mean, Danilo's delivery could have been better. Militao's delivery could have been better. I think they completed one cross between the pair of them in, you know, I think Militao came off after 106 minutes. Danilo saw out the full game. So not particularly great from that standpoint. But yeah, Brazil running out of ideas in attack. It, I, I didn't think that was a conclusion we'd arrive at. Uh, I mean, no. what was the XG? 2.6 in the end to 0 0.7 in Brazil's favour. So maybe on another day, they do enough to to go through. Uh, Beckett and Alisson didn't have a lot of uh, traffic coming his way. We've already discussed that. But yeah, I just didn't think very inventive when they met a it's just a really coherent deep to mid block um is there anything else mccubs you want to add before we round off this episode i don't want, know, I, yeah. I mean i love brazil so i'm yeah. sad here so yeah well i'll follow on from that because i don't have that much else in terms of analysis i don't think but it is i don't know it's pretty mad isn't it because i think that that career game that first half of that career game felt like the return of Brazil in the World Cup. It, it, yeah. felt like, it felt like that, didn't it? It felt like that. And um, I think in this game, I think against many, many other teams, um, almost maybe any other international team, I think that Neymar goal, because we haven't even talked about that Neymar goal, by the way, because if, if Brazil win this game, that's, you know, maybe mm. goal of the tournament. I mean, it's it was so good. The 2-1-2s, um, you know, especially the second one with Paqueta and then rounding the keeper and, you know, out-muscling Sosa, although I think Sosa is at fault there. It's just, I, I, you know, that go a goal like of that description in the 105th minute of a World Cup quarter final against Brazil would kill most teams off, I think, mentally. Um, and I think they just so happen to be up against Croatia, who, you know, are just, you know, abnor abnormally, ab yeah. abnormally well versed in these kind of situations. It is weird. Like, I know it's, I think a lot's made of kind of, you know, records like this, but it is mad that Croatia just. Are very happy to go to the, uh, go to extra mm. time all the time, and it's and it's the person I, I think, I think changes, they, but the mentality doesn't. Yeah, and I, th yeah. I think you know, I think from the word go, Croatia were happy to go to penalties, and and Brazil probably knew that. I think even like a side like Morocco, who did that to Spain, probably would have struggled against Brazil to do it, just because you know they, they've been doing that all tournament, and they would eventually tire. I think. Mm. Um, whereas Croatia, I think it probably is just down to the fact they've got you know Modric, Brozovic, and. Kovacic in that midfield like we've seen Modric do this like we saw like I think it was in the the extra time against Chelsea in the quarterfinal of the Champions League back in April I, I, I that's the first time I'd seen Modric you know really put himself about that late in a game at this you know at this stage of his career and I was amazed I just thought that was an anomaly I was just like mm. surely Modric can't do that mm. all the time but he does do that all the time it is just it's a, he's a bit of a freak in that sense so yeah, I mean, I think Brazil did enough to to win a game like this, um, but it just didn't happen. You know, they they also defended brilliantly for most of the game. Croatia did, you know, ask questions of them, and it just so happened that you know five minutes before the end or ten minutes before the end, whenever it was, um, they they just they, they they had their first big defensive lapse of the whole tournament, and it cost them. Yeah, big time. Uh, yeah, you're right to sort of bring Neymar to the fore because. 
He got a bit of flack from the commentators in this game, but still five shots, five on target. Brazil only had 10 as a team. I know a lot of those shots weren't high quality opportunities, you know, the goal aside. He did complete three dribbles, though he attempted nine. Not at his flying best, but a perfectly serviceable uh, performance with a big moment in there that would have gone down in World Cup folklore had, mm -hmm. had uh, Croatia not clawed themselves back into the game. Just, I'm a little bit breathless. The game was quite breathless. It was an entertaining draw anyway, wasn't it? Um, is there anything you want to add? Is there any other interesting tactical sort of nuances uh, that we've missed out before we throw to the team at home? Well, I don't know if we've necessarily missed it out, but what I would say is that when Brazil went a goal up, what really cost them was that they couldn't do what Croatia had done all game which was just have settled possession and calm the game mm. down. I think at that point, you know, they took off uh, Paqueta and Militao and they brought on Fred. They brought on Fred and Alexandro. Mm. I think that maybe a Fabinho, not just because of his defensive abilities, but just because of his calmness on the ball would have been really useful for them. And what they lack is just that guy who is a tempo setter, you know, a Rodri type who would have just passed it side to side, basically taken the sting out of the game. Whereas instead, they let Croatia have more of the ball. Croatia grew into things, started finding gaps down the wings, which they really shouldn't be doing in a game that they're losing in the second half of extra time. And that, to me, was the difference. If you'd put even Brozovic, you know, who, who's my least favourite of that midfield three, in, in the Brazil midfield for the last 15 minutes of that game, I think they would have seen it out. Mm. I think it would have been that, that would have been the difference because just taking the sting out of the game is something Croatia did time and time again and Brazil couldn't do. I mean, just to support your claims there, Fred was on for 15 minutes and not to single Fred out in any way, shape or form because it, is, it wasn't his fault they ultimately lost, but he only completed two passes in that time, which does mm. point towards mm. a frantic grandstand finish. Yeah, it's uh, a track meet. You don't want to get, su why would you get sucked into a track meet in the second half of extra time yeah. when you're winning? It just, I mean, it's not Fred's fault, like you say, because he's not that sort of player. Mm. It's about having the right profiles in your squad. And I think sometimes you want a player who's maybe not quite as talented mm. as another, but he does do the right things. Look at someone like Henderson for England. You know, we've talked about Henderson losing a step, but what Henderson does have is a degree of composure and an ability to set the tempo in England need him to. And that sort of thing is really, really useful. Yeah. And before we finish, I do just want to sound out Croatia's work rate in transition. It was just monstrous, wasn't it? 50-50 in terms of possession by the end of extra time, but Croatia put up 28 tackles to Brazil's 16. Everybody chipped in. Like you said, that midfield, absolutely formidable, but Juranovic as well, Sosa. Anyway, I don't want to get back into it because I've almost mentally checked out. That game has exhausted me, but what did you lot think at home? Let us know in the comments below. And if you were Croatia manager, how do you set up for that mouth-watering semi-final? Hit us up and we'll get back to you in the first hour. Like the video, subscribe to the channel with notifications on and we'll catch you on EFD very, very shortly.